members of the Ministry of Environment or their members. The Minister of Environment wishes to make a statement to the House this morning. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the House is aware, the Planning Bill completed consideration stage on the 25th of June. Since I took over the portfolio as Minister of the Environment, with responsibility for planning, I have been carefully considering the provisions in the Bill and taking the time to meet with key stakeholders and listen to their views. I have reflected at length on the purpose and intent of the Bill as it was agreed with the Executive and introduced to the Assembly in January this year, and I have looked back to the second stage debate. I will quote my predecessor, Alex Atwood, who summed up the purpose and intent of the Bill at that time when he said, It takes the elements that will be put into place in 2015 and puts them into place now in order to ensure that the councils and councillors have a better planning system that is more fit to serve the interests of ratepayers post-2015. The Bill, as introduced, also included two provisions which had not featured in the Planning Act 2011. Firstly, that in preparing planning policy and plans, the Department should do so with the objective of promoting economic development. And secondly, when it comes to the determination of planning applications by the Department and in future by the Councils, Material considerations will include a reference to any economic advantages or disadvantages that are likely to result from the approval or refusal of planning permission. My predecessor rightly supported those provisions because they affirm what already happens today. That is, economic considerations are material when it comes to determining a planning application or in framing planning policy. That does not give determinative weight to economic considerations in a planning decision, but means that they will be a material factor, along with other material factors that are part of the planning system. That is what the Bill states. It does not state more than that. Moving on to Amendments 20 and 26, which were tabled at consideration stage. Those amendments were the subject of great concern to many members of this Assembly. And indeed, the debate went on for a considerable time over two days, and despite, in my view, the weight of the argument being against the amendments, they were voted in and now stand as part of the Bill. Since taking office, I have had meetings with key stakeholders, including representatives of the business community in Northern Ireland, local government, environmental groups, and academics from Queen's and the University of Ulster in order to listen to their thoughts on the Planning Bill as amended at consideration stage. I have carefully and fully studied the legal advice obtained by my predecessor and I have made that advice publicly available. Having deliberated at considerable length on those amendments, I still have serious concerns and those concerns are held by many of the stakeholders. My concerns are threefold, legal, procedural and evidential. I will begin by addressing the legal concerns. Clause 15 of the Bill, as amended, will limit the right to judicially review certain planning decisions taken by OFM, DFM, the Department or a future Council. The legal advice received by my predecessor is clear on this amendment. This advice has been shared with executive colleagues and others who requested it, and I believe it is important to share with all members. Therefore, I have deposited a copy in the library. I will once again quote extracts of that advice for the record. Planning decisions are generally regarded as determinative of civil rights. However, judicial review is generally required to secure compliance with Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, since decisions by government, local or national, are not considered to be independent, i.e. not independent of the executive. If JR is restricted to EU and ECHR grounds, then we do not consider that this would secure compliance 
with Article 6 ECHR, except in a narrow group of cases. JRs on traditional common law grounds of breach of procedural requirements, failures of consultation, Wednesbury on reasonableness and the like would not be within the narrow grounds permitted unless they overlapped with a permitted ground. For example, some grounds relating to natural justice might overlap with Article 6. Even challenges based on ultra vires would be sought to be excluded. Our view is that the exclusion proposed in terms of the grounds of challenges would amount to incompatibility with the ECHR and thus fail the legislative competence requirements of Section 6 of the Northern Ireland Act. I also have concerns in relation to the economically significant planning zone amendment and the legal advice my predecessor received would confirm these concerns. Again, I will quote an extract from it. There are problems with European obligations and that proposals envisage that planning permission will be granted by the designation of the ESPZ for whatever is specified in the scheme. The advice continues. There is no exception made for sites designated pursuant to the Wild Birds Directive, Special Protection Areas, or Habitats Directive, special areas of conservation, which have the protection of Article 6.3 of the Habitats Directive. Since those provisions prohibit the grant of consent, unless there are no likely significant effects caused to the designated site by the development or following an appropriate assessment, it is found there is no adverse effect to the integrity of the site, Article 13A2, that is Article 13A2 of the Bill, would be in breach of the directive. This would expose the DOE to challenge to the legality of the provision and expose the UK to infraction proceedings by the Commission. In our view, the proposals would fail the legislative competence requirements of Section 6 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. Returning to Clause 15, I believe that we should exercise caution in relation to restricting the right to judicially review planning decisions. The consideration stage debate reflected very clearly the concerns of many members in this Assembly. Not often do I agree with them. However, on this occasion, I am compelled to agree with Mr Allister when he said at consideration stage that the courts have played a vital role as a restraint on the abuse of executive power, and that is why the function of judicial review has evolved over many years. However, the obvious effect and purpose of Amendment No. 26 is to remove from the citizen the right to have recourse to that remedy in the manner that he or she currently has. This view is also held by the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, which recently wrote to me on this matter, stating that judicial review plays an important and legitimate role in ensuring the proper administration of government, and Clause 15 would, in effect, remove the court's ability to review the legality, the rationality, and the reasonableness of planning decisions. I am also conscious of the views of the Honourable Mr Justice Tracy, a senior judicial review judge in Northern Ireland, who earlier this year, in addressing a seminar, spoke on proposals to reform judicial review in England and Wales. His opening remarks sum up my concerns, and I will quote him. Judicial review is the principal means by which citizens can access the historic constitutional role of the courts to protect against abuses of power by public authorities. It is a vital safeguard. It promotes the public interest, encourages public bodies to act lawfully and within their powers, ensures such bodies are not above the law, and protects the rights and interests of those affected by the unlawful exercise of power. He also added, Lord Wolfe, the former Chief Justice, and Lord Goldsmith, former Attorney General, have warned that the government should proceed with caution with any changes that could be seen as restricting the right to hold politicians to account. Clearly, 
These are matters that should greatly concern this Assembly. Nor do I believe it is appropriate or sensible to bring forward provisions which fail the legislative competence requirements of Section 6 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 and run the risk of exposing Northern Ireland to infraction proceedings. I will now outline the procedural concerns that I have. It is, of course, legitimate for amendments to be made during the passage of a bill through the Assembly. However, these two significant amendments go far beyond what would normally be tabled at consideration stage, and I am concerned that they were never subject to the full rigours of public consultation, executive consideration, or Environment Committee scrutiny. I do not therefore believe that the threshold for proper consultation and participation with regard to these amendments has been met. I will now deal with my evidential concerns. I wholeheartedly agree that the planning system has a role to play in facilitating economic development. There is clear evidence that we are responding to that imperative. As a result of vigorous action by my predecessor, action which I intend to continue, the planning system is now much better placed to support economic development, providing greater certainty on outcome and timeframes for managing applications. There are numerous examples of how planning has delivered approvals for key projects quickly. The Peace Bridge in Derry, from receipt to approval in 11 weeks, the £30 million redevelopment of Windsor Park Football Stadium in 11 weeks. That actually prompted the Belfast Telegraph to say it was a pity the Northern Ireland team can't play with the same focus and pace as DOE planning. The £70 million regional radiotherapy unit at Altna Galvin Hospital approved in 11 weeks. Nora Water Bridge the northern portion was dealt with three weeks quicker than on board Planala in the south. The Peace Building and Reconciliation Centre at May's Long Cache approved in five months. And the relocation of the Royal Ulster Agricultural Society to May's Long Cache approved in less than six months. In May 2011, there were 60 Article 31 applications in the system, and to date, a further 11 applications have been received. Of those 71 applications, 40 have been determined, reducing the number of Article 31 applications in the system to 31 at present. Just yesterday, I announced permission for a huge mixed-use development in Newton Ards, which will transform the now derelict Crepe Weavers factory site and could provide up to 400 jobs and give a tremendous economic and social boost to the area. This decision is further evidence of my determination to clear the backlog of planning applications and provide a planning system which can deliver. Since I have become Minister, a number of other major significant applications have been approved. A 120 bed hotel and over 22,000 square feet of office development has been approved in Newry. That project is estimated to cost in the region of £12 million. Another application for 11 separate storage and distribution units uh, was approved at Nuts Corner Roundabout near Antrim. A multi-million pound mixed-use development at Glenmona in West Belfast including housing, a hotel, an education campus, local retail, recreation and community facilities, and a new £20 million data centre in Coleraine. This is the first of three phases of the development of a data hub capitalising on the Project Kelvin high-speed transatlantic communications link. The application was turned around in just nine weeks. Speedy decisions such as this emphasise my department's commitment and my own to assist business and help strengthen our economy. It also demonstrates that such applications are being handled consistently 
within the programme for government target to ensure that 90 per cent of large-scale investment planning decisions are made within six months and applications with job creation pot potential are given additional weight. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the planning system now effectively and demonstrably supports economic development. I am determined to work with all parties so it can be further improved. Judicial reviews are often high profile in nature, but the reality is that they are relatively few in number. Whilst the executive and indeed any minister responsible for planning may not always welcome such challenges, it is fair to say that such a process is a fundamental right of citizens. And I could go a step further and say that the potential threat of judicial review has been one of the key reasons that the planning system has remained fair and objective. Over the past three years, there have been less than 20 judicial reviews of the 44,000 decisions made by DOE planning. That's a tiny, tiny fraction of the total number of decisions made. It seems to me that restricting the right of citizens to challenge planning decisions is not only incompatible with our obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights, but also represents taking a hammer to crack a very small nut. The fact is also that the grounds for the most significant and high-profile planning JRs of recent years will be unaffected by these amendments to the Bill which acknowledge that the right of appeal to the High Court must remain where there is a question about the compatibility of a decision or determination with EU law. Such issues of EU law have been key grounds for many of the JR challenges to high-profile planning decisions of recent years. But other grounds would be affected. For example, decisions made outside of legal powers or where the decision was plainly irrational. As regards the proposal to introduce economically significant planning zones, I want to remind members that existing provisions in the 1991 planning order empower the executive through my department to make simplified planning zones, which are not materially different from ESPZs. Indeed, the amendments brought forward on ESPZs appear to have been largely duplicated from the earlier legislation. A simplified planning zone allows the planning authority to bring forward a scheme for an area which has the effect of granting planning permission to certain classes of development as set out within the scheme without the need to apply for planning permission. If simplified planning zones have been on the statute book for so long, it begs the question why neither I nor any other planning minister under direct rule or devolution have been approached about using that power. And if it was considered that the exercise of such power should be a key feature of the economic package agreed with the London government, why my predecessor was not simply consulted about how the existing law already in place could be activated. I would be very happy to consider any such approach. However, it is now clear that the intent of the amendments on ESPZs was not to introduce new planning powers, but simply to make OFMDFM a new planning authority in Northern Ireland. Bearing all this in mind, I can see no good reason to introduce ESPZs and to vest such planning powers in another department. This could only introduce confusion into the planning system. Furthermore, in considering the Planning Act 2011, the, the Assembly decided that the power to put in place simplified planning zones should transfer from my department to local government as part of local government reform. What is now proposed in these amendments stands in stark contrast to the Executive and Assembly's decision to empower local government and bring forward zones of this kind. Therefore, this is not only an attempt to grab existing planning powers from my department, but also an attempt
to disempower future local government. I am committed to local government reform and I am the Minister responsible for driving that agenda to a satisfactory conclusion by April 2015. In agreeing the Planning Act 2011, the Assembly agreed that my department should transfer the vast majority of the department's planning powers to councils. That is the correct thing to do. I am concerned that the ESPZ amendment will be diluting the Executive's commitment, endorsed by this Assembly, to transfer planning powers to councils. The amendments are contrary to the principles underlying the devolution of planning powers from central to local government, and that concerns me greatly. When Arlene Foster made her statement to the Assembly on local government reform on the 31st of March 2008, she said, Our vision is of a strong, dynamic local government that creates vibrant, healthy, prosperous, safe and sustainable communities that have the needs of all citizens at their core. She further added, successful local councils must be effective local champions that respond to the aspirations and concerns of their communities and guide, in partnership with others, the future development of their area. Strong civic leadership must be at the heart of the new council arrangements. In addition, when Edwin Poots moved the Now Planning Act 2011 to its second stage in December 2010, he said, the planning bill sets out proposals to transform our planning system. It provides for a transfer of better, faster development plans and development management functions to councils. That means that the councils will be the planning authorities. He continued, the transformation is fundamental to the development of local accountable democracy. It puts power and responsibility for the development of local areas exactly where it should be, in the hands of locally elected representatives accountable to the people. The ESPZ amendment runs counter to that vision. It disempowers local councils, allowing OFMDFM to dictate what it thinks is best for local communities and what development can go ahead in the Council's area without any form of recourse. As members will appreciate, I have grave reservations about the amendments to the Planning Bill in respect of ESPZs and the restriction of the right to judicial review for legal, procedural and evidential reasons. Therefore, after very careful and lengthy consideration, I have decided not to move the Planning Bill to further consideration stage, either now or in the future. I intend to continue to make prompt and sound planning decisions through the development of a single strategic planning policy statement to create a planning system that is fast, fair and fit for purpose. One that delivers for business, but not at the expense of our planet or of our people. As Environment Minister, I want to help create a better environment and a stronger economy. Regrettably, this bill, as it stands, does neither. You're here. You're here. Hello, Chair of the Environment Committee. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for his uh, a very comprehensive statement, and I certainly very much welcome uh, the statement. And I want to congratulate, I want to commend the Minister for his decision, for his courage to stand up, I think, to others who want to see uh, amendments to take away uh, civil liberties, to take away the rights of citizens uh, for judicial reviews. Um, However, uh, the judicial here today is the member speaking or as chairman of the committee, or is she speaking order, as an individual order, committee? Order, 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 order. I'm sure the member will make it absolutely clear uh, whether she's speaking as chair of the committee or as a member of the house. Okay, uh, I'm speaking as a chair of the committee. Uh, what I want to say is, we as uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, during the scrutiny stage of the bill, we did receive the committee received. Order, or order, the or order. The convention is there. No point of order taken during a ministerial statement. Yeah. I've already made that clear to the House earlier on the educational statement. But I'm happy not to take point of order after after the statement is concluded. I'll allow the member to continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for that clarification. It would be useful to the House if the member could clearly state that she is now speaking on behalf of the committee. Uh, Again, for members. I, I am speaking as the chair of the committee, and if I may finish my sentence before interruption, uh, the committee took a long time uh, to scrutinise the bill, although it is quite uh, a short bill, but we received an extremely large uh, amount of responses from the public, from our stakeholders, and they all, and many of them expressed grave concerns, like the Minister, uh, on the amendments uh, put forward, and, and also uh, on, the, on, the, on the new uh, provisions in the bill. But also, uh, we, uh, as, as a chair of the committee, I received a large amount of emails and um, correspondence during consideration stage when, the, new, when the, the two new amendments were put forward. And I was extremely concerned uh, of the lack of public consultation with the two amendments put forward during consideration stage. So I think as a chair of the environment, I have the right to say that I certainly uh, have reservations about two amendments not subject not subject to enough public consultation. O o order, order. He I'm hesitant to intervene, but I'm trying to listen to the member very carefully. Is the member asking a question on behalf of the committee, or is she asking a question as a private member? I am going to ask as the committee a chair. Okay. Um, um, obviously, the uh, planning bill uh, is meant to bring forward a number of aspects of the Planning Act 2011, and the committee really largely support the planning bill. I just want to ask the minister if now he is going to withdraw the bill, what about the elements uh, in the bill, for example, uh, if I may uh, read from this act, I can't remember all the, all the details. Clause 5 is about pre-application consultation with the community. Clause 7 and 8 is about the power for the department to deal with repeated applications. 9, power for the department to require developers to reinstate land that has been used for, uh, for mineral extraction. Uh, 17, promoted to positive management and enhancement of conservation areas and clause 20. Order, 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 order. Uh, the member is coming to your question. Thank you. Uh, so all, all those elements, uh, how is the department going to deal with this? The idea was to bring forward, the idea was to bring forward those elements so that they are embedded in our planning structure before the new councils take over the power uh, of planning. I uh, thank uh, the chairperson of the Environment Committee for her question and for her warm welcome to my statement. It's not how I expect it to go down in all quarters today. I am fully committed to the reform of the planning system, the improvement of the planning system, and the elements there that you outlined within the planning bill as it originally stood, I am determined to incorporate into the planning system through the continued development of the single strategic planning policy statement. And I'm determined to work with all sectors to ensure that the planning system that we do get in place for transfer to local councils is as close to perfect as it can be. I am aware that another aspect was an amendment that was brought to the bill at a consideration stage by Ms Lowe and by others proposing to introduce a duty to the department in exercising its functions 
to do so have in regard to the desirability of promoting the shared use of the public realm between persons of different religious belief, political opinion and racial group. My predecessor at that time gave a commitment that while that amendment was not moved, he would certainly try to incorporate it, and I reaffirm that commitment. I think it is very important that we do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, unlike the chair of the committee, I will speak as a as a member of this house. And um, unlike the chair of the committee, I am actually deeply disappointed at the minister's statement today, which, for me, flies in the face of the de democratic um, legislative decision of the assembly. Can I ask the minister what approval was sought from the executive on this decision, and if it was even consulted? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Ms. Bryan. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Uh, I think that's a bit rich if we look at the lack of consultation around, around, the, amendments, around the amendments that have made this, that have made this bill the toxic piece of legislation that it now is, and actually derailed, derailed it is the amendments that have derailed the attempt to fast forward the transforming or transformation of the, the planning system here and the, the improvement of it. No, I did not raise this with executive colleagues. This is something I th have thought long and hard about. It is a decision I arrived at over the weekend. However, to be accused of being anti-democratic is a bit rich whenever the amendments were not subject to consultation with the executive, were not subject to consultation with the Environment Committee, were not even subject as far as I am aware, the consultation with the parties who brought them's own members. Could I thank the Minister for a statement? And could I just put on record that Mr Speaker, I, I believe that the amendments brought forward are compliant with EU obligations, and I don't think that any member of this Assembly would try to subvert or avoid EU obligations. But I want to just ask the Minister in relation to this. Has the Minister sought or received any advice, any legal advice from the Attorney General in relation to this matter? And can he confirm whether it is consistent with any legal advice he has received from others? I have not sought advice from the Attorney General, nor have I received advice from the Attorney General. I have received legal advice from an eminent QC in this field, and that is legal advice that I have shared with this House. It is legal advice available to the public. I have not heard any legal opinion contrary to that advice, and I have spoken to many lawyers, many academics, many planning experts over the past four months and have received no advice whatsoever that the advice read into the record by my predecessor at consideration stage was erroneous or in any way challengeable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister and welcome this important statement. The Minister has outlined uh, just on legal advice and placed on the record the clear legal advice that his department has received in respect of the illegalities of the DUP and Sinn Féin amendments. Has the Minister been shown the legal advice by OFM, DFM, and who provided that advice? The short answer is no, and I don't know. <laughs> uh, as you've pointed out, I have shared, as I have pointed out, I have shared the advice obtained by my predecessor. He read it into the record. I haven't seen any legal advice that was received by OFM, DFM, or whoever had brought the amendments. Although Mr. Weir did allude to the fact in an interview on radio last week that it was OFM, DFM, but I have not seen that legal advice. And my door has been open for four months. People knew the, the legal position as stated by my predecessor. My door has been open to see any legal advice to the contrary. I have not seen it. But my door remains open to that legal advice coming forward. And I am keen to work with anyone and everyone to ensure that we do 
get, get this sorted and ensure that we have a planning system that's fair, fit for purpose and fast. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, thank you. May I welcome uh, the Minister's statement, which leaves me in no doubt that the proposed power grab uh, by OFM DFM in terms of economic planning was so ill-conceived, so badly thought through, so arrogant that it's actually illegal. And can I ask the minister, can I ask the minister if he will tell and confirm to the House that he will stand firm in continuing to offer responsible leadership, because no doubt he will come under various pressures to change his mind. The member used the term power grab. That's not a term that I intend to use today. This statement is about planning. It's not about politics. And I will stand firm to ensure that the planning system in Northern Ireland is fair and is legal. Mr. Wheel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too am disappointed at the Minister's statement. And it seems in terms of the he seems to have based a lot of this on legal advice. He gave answer uh, to a previous questioner that he had not consulted with the Attorney General, who is the senior legal advisor to the executive. Can I ask him why did he not consult with the Attorney General? Thank you, uh, Mr. Weir. I had to make a judgment on this bill in the best interests of the planning system based on the evidence in front of me. I'm not prepared to derogate this responsibility or leave it to others. I want to look at the big picture, not just this bill, but how it relates to the wider local government reform programme and the transfer of planning powers to councils. The bill is not good law, and I have yet to hear anyone, even today, try and claim that, that it is. It's not good for the planning system, and it's not good for the economy. That's what the business representatives that I have been speaking to are telling me as well. It would actually be counterproductive by creating confusion. If this bill was to pass as it stands now, there are NGOs and groups queuing up to legally challenge it. How is that going to make things faster? How is that going to create more certainty in the system? How is that going to promote inward investment and, and, and help development and create jobs? It's not. Mr. Morrow. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I think it's most significant that the Minister didn't think it worth his while to consult with the Attorney General. But in his statement today, he was careful to quote what Justice Tracy uh, had to say. But alas, he didn't say everything that Justice Tracy said. I could have reminded him. And, and ask him that in light of the fact that the, the, this decision was taken subsequent to the Tracy ruling, which indicated that a minister who failed to bring a controversial decision to the full executive was in breach of the ministerial code, why is the minister defying that ruling here today and deliberately breaking that ministerial code? I uh, dispute that I am breaking the ministerial code. I wonder, was advice sought from the Attorney General on these amendments before they, they were tabled? And if not, why not? And if so, order, order, order. 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 And if so order. why? People will ask when they hear an accusation that I might be breaking the ministerial code. People, the public, will rightly ask, what is the ministerial code? Do you know, if someone is deemed, if someone is deemed, if someone is deemed not to be in breach of the code for denying someone the, the right to donate blood based on their sexuality or for promoting public disorder, they are not in breach of the code. But for trying to prevent bad law from coming in, I am. I don't. I don't think so. I can only act on the legal advice that I have seen. I'm open to hear other legal advice. Certainly, I have sought it. From many places, that's not one. Dominic Bradley, Mr. Bradley. Kramil Maya got a concolle. I was a faultium riv kinu anara at Gan Dolorai Lechan Villa Shaw, Fuimur Tashe Lassiha. 
Gudevin Horme Spesh in Savage at Durchinara, Queen Limester Flanala, August Boylum Keshtakor in a Div. Can I ask the Minister, does he agree with me that the amendment around economically uh, significant planning zones was in fact a spurious proposal, given the fact that the power already existed? under the provision for simplified planning zones in the 1991 planning order. I tried to, to get it in Irish, but I didn't know spurious. <laughs> I don't know, understand it in English. <laughs> In the absence of, of any detail and information on what will constitute an ESPZ and what type of applications will qualify, there are and can be no guarantees, assurances or clarity about how these provisions will help the economy. No one has established the benefits, benefits or costs of these proposals or who they will benefit or who they will harm. In fact, these clauses are, in my opinion, largely replicated from the simplified planning zones, but without the safeguards that existed in the simplified planning zones in terms of areas of special scientific interest and, and habitats. Uh, that is why I do not see any merit in this, th this amendment, and it is why I am happy to speak to anyone about dusting down the provisions from the 1991 planning order and seeing how we can make those best work in a way that will deliver for the economy but protect the environment. John McAllister. Mr McAllister. Uh, what a shambles, Mr Speaker. Could I congratulate the Minister actually on his solo run and having the courage to stand up uh, to, to this uh, administration? Does he agree with me that the attempted the attempted power grab effectively amounts to the government scuppering its own bill, and doesn't that highlight the dysfunctionality of this administration? Thank uh, Mr. McAllister for welcoming my statement. But let me assure you, Mr. McAllister, this is not a solo run. This is supported and will be supported by many in this house and by many more outside this house. I don't want to go down the lines of power grab. I, I did say in response to an earlier question that I believe this bill, a noble attempt to improve the planning system, has been derailed by these amendments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, given the fact that the Minister in the past has described the use of a petition of concern as being um, putting up two fingers to other parties. Can the Minister not see the hypocrisy in his statement today? And how many fingers is he putting up to other parties today? Sorry, uh, Mr Speaker, I'm just trying to, to count my fingers. <laughs> I, uh, my, uh, I recall my description of uh, the abuse of a petition of concern as such, not the use of a petition of concern, the abuse of a petition of concern when it was able to be used by one party, one party to thwart the wishes of other parties in the Assembly. Now, as it stands, the majority of parties in this Assembly will certainly be behind me, and they will be giving my statement the thumbs up, not the fingers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the Minister is doing a statement in much of the, the uh, perceived limit on the judicial reviews and said that it would be restricting the rights of citizens. I am quite sure the Minister is aware of the Historical Institutional Abuse Act that was passed by this Assembly, and a clause 19 of that said bill uh, it limits judicial reviews to 14 days. If that bill was legally competent, why do these believe that the uh, amendments brought to the planning bill wouldn't be? I have quoted legal advice that I received. I can go back and get legal advice on the question that uh, Mr Ross 
has asked as well, and I endeavour to do so. But let us look. Let us let, let, order, order. Let us order. look at the issues here. There are European Charter issues, order. and order. Order. member asks a question. The minister then must be heard. Order, order. The amendment around the restrictions on the judicial reviews or the right to judicial review in this amendment are in contravention of the European Convention on Human Rights. That's in the legal advice I received. It's also been reaffirmed to me by the Human Rights Commission. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a former member of the Environment Committee, I was fortunate to benefit with some knowledge and experience of the Scottish planning system. So my question to the Minister is, do you believe that by modernising and updating our legislation that it is possible to build a much more responsive uh, local government based planning system in Northern Ireland which can meet the needs of industry without trampling over the needs over, over the individual rights of citizens. I fully believe that that is possible. That's something the planning service has been working towards and it's something that I aspire to. It's often you pointed, the member pointed to how well planning is working in another jurisdiction. But let me be quite clear, planning is working well here. It's working a lot better here than it was. The last two years have seen dramatic improvements in terms of the processing of applications and the approvals of applications. I, continue, I aim to continue that trend and I hope to have the support of all members in doing so. Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, and I've listened to him today, and he said on a, a few occasions that he's happy to speak to anyone. And given the concerns his department has had in relation to the bill and amendments at consideration station, stage, what discussions have took place with those who were bringing forward the amendments or any other department? And I can also add, in terms of, in, the, in his, one of his last paragraphs, um, we talked about proun, pr sorry, prompt and sound planning decisions. And you make reference to the Article 31s, where the previous minister had 71 applications. And he, I think you're, you're, there's nearly like a prerequisite in terms of your position here today, in terms of getting the position where he cleared his desk. And one of those, would you suggest, was a prompt, uh, prompt decision where 4,500 objections to a business that no longer existed was a good decision to be made by planning service? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Clark. I'm not sure to which Article 31 uh, decision Mr. Clark is referring, but I'm, I wonder if it's one that my predecessor had, uh, had inherited from his. Order. Order. Uh, uh, could I ask the Minister what guarantees were in fact provided by the proposers of Clause 4? that the proposed establishment of economically simplified planning zones were not, in fact, a real recipe and a free-for-all for frackers. Uh, thank you, Mr. McLone. Gur As earlier stated, I have received no details, no guarantees or any information about what will constitute an ESPZ and what applications will qualify. In the vacuum, of any details. Nothing, including fracking, in my opinion, can be ruled in or ruled out, especially in light of comments by colleagues from across the chamber about the economic significance of fracking. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, again, I'm disappointed in the Minister's uh, statement today. Uh, and if the Minister had concerns about some Bill, uh, some uh, clauses within the bill and the supposed legality of those clauses. Why has he decided to end it now? Why not go through the process? But why not just keep the bill as it was and, and seek legal advice on those very clauses? I thank uh, Mr. Frew for his question. I did not want to waste more time on this bill and have this House waste more time on this bill and have my officials waste more time on this bill. They are currently uh, drawing 
subordinate legislation for the transfer of planning powers to councils from the 2011 Act. Should this bill have received passage, they would have to do the same for it, a duplication and effect of their work. I was not prepared for, for that to happen. Also, should this bill have secured passage and should it have been approved by this House, I have, as outlined earlier, no doubt that it would have been subject to legal challenge from people outside of this House and possibly even from within. This would have led to a complete slowdown of the planning system and is completely contrary to the aim originally behind this bill. Stephen Agnew. Mr. Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I welcome the Minister's statement on behalf of my party, on behalf of the Green Party, and many others outside of this House. The Minister has made a sound, rational, and ultimately the right decision. This House is a legisl legislature. If I can say that, has, has to act responsibly and within the law. Can the Minister confirm that it is the duty on all Ministers and indeed all members to, to act within the law and, and legislate within existing laws and not to tr seek to circumvent the law to pursue a personal agenda? I was questioned earlier, or there was a question, a question put to me and a question mark put over me and my adherence to the Ministerial Code. But as an a, as a elected politician, as a minister, as a person, I do not believe that anyone should break the law. That is why I believe my actions today are not in breach of any code. I think while it is also important that our decisions are legal, it is most important that our decisions are to the benefit of the people that we represent. The bill, as amended, was not. Jonathan Craig. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I have listened with interest to everything you said around all this legal advice and lack of it in some cases. You also mentioned that you had consulted with businesses on this. I am going to ask a very serious question. What businesses were those that you actually consulted with? Was one of those John Lewis? This wonderful planning system that you have rhymed on and on and on about, there is an application that took 10 years in the process and ultimately it did not happen. Did you consult with John Lewis? And what measures are you going to take to improve that situation? Because there is nothing in the existing planning process that would not allow a repeat of that fiasco. No uh, simple answer to that question. I did not consult with John Lewis. Perhaps previous planning ministers or DOE ministers have consulted more with business th than I do. But in line with my predecessor's announcement, which accompanied the release of my department's decision to re on those parts of BMAP relevant to Spruce Field, I consider it appropriate to adopt a precautionary approach to major out-of-town retailing. And that's something that I hear from all sides of this House whenever we debate the future of town and city centres, that they need to support town centres, yet it seems that, that, uh, that a different rules apply when it comes to John Lewis. Currently, there is no application from John Lewis. If another one comes in, it will be looked at. It will be subject to the full rigours of the planning process. Mr. McDonald. Thank, Mr. McDonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And could I ask the Minister if he isn't just been a bit polite and a bit gentle, and, and uh, agree, could he agree with me that these amendments, when they were made, were crude, they were little thought out, and they were, they were totally inappropriate, and quite simply were made without any consultation with the public, with, with the, the Assembly generally, with the Executive, or even with the individual parties of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. And are tantamount, were tantamount to a blatant power grab by the OFM DFM with no respect for anybody. Uh, thank, I thank uh, Dr. Macdonald for his question. I have already stated in, in, in response to questions from around the House this morning that I do not want to get into 
finger pointing or raising Mr. McRae <laughs> or raising M M Mr. McRae about the intention behind these amendments. I am not concerned. Others do see it quite clearly as a power grab. I am not too concerned about my department losing power, but this, these amendments would actually disempower future local councils, and I do not think that is right, given two weeks ago we, we voted to empower them. Mr. Duff. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, can I ask the Minister, considering the considerable debate we had yesterday on economic development and the need for more foreign direct investment, what sort of me negative message does this send out to potential investors looking at coming now to Northern Ireland? Thank uh, M Mr. Dunn for his question. However, I do not think this does send out a negative message, and I think it is important that we send out no negative messages. I have outlined already steps that my department have taken, decisions that I have made to promote economic development. I have outlined already my concerns that the ESPZs will do nothing to speed up inward investment, subject to a legal challenge. They will only create uncertainty. And what any inward investor looks for in the planning system is certainty, as well as swiftness. Certainty is even more important. I want to get it out today. I want anyone listening to this debate to be in no doubt that I support a stronger economy. I think it is vitally important that the message goes out that Northern Ireland is open for business and Northern Ireland is good for business. And I want to make sure that that is reflected in the planning system. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I too am disappointed at this statement by the Minister today. But can I ask the Minister? If there were concerns on legal competence, why did the Minister not follow normal procedure and seek to have the relevant clauses referred for a ruling at the Supreme Court and to leave the rest of the bill intact? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have spoken already about the intention behind this bill. It was to basically road test the new planning powers that will be transferred to local councils in 2015. The fact is, though, the four, during the four months that have lapsed since the, the, the last reading of this bill, we are running out of road. The longer this goes on, the less point there is in bringing this bill forward. And I, my door has not been knocked down by OFM, DFM or whoever had tabled the amendments to ask me to bring this bill to the Assembly. Ian McCarthy. Mr Speaker, thank you very much indeed. And can I welcome the statement by the, the Minister this morning. And I just want to congratulate him. It is good to see a, a young, fresh uh, uh, planning minister who can make decisions for Strangford uh, in Newtonards. Um, and we very much welcome it. Can I ask uh, the Minister for to give us a... Can I ask the... Well, we waited, a little, we waited a long time for the Newton Arts development, so thank you, Minister. Um, yeah, Mr. Speaker, could I ask the Minister for a, a timescale on the introduction of the strategic planning policy? Will it be uh, made before the new councils come into being? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I fully intend for the single strategic planning policy statement to be, finalized, or to be ready in draft form by the turn of the year when it will go out to public consultation. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. And like uh, many others, I express my concern about the Minister's statement. And despite the fact that he assures us that he is open for business and that uh, he was running out of road, as, as he uh, 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 put it, uh, I think many uh, in Northern Ireland with an interest on in the economy will be somewhat uh, concerned about his reasons for, for this decision. But can I ask him quite specifically, quite specifically, what consultations took place on the options of dealing with his concerns through amendments at further consideration stage? Forgive me, Mr Speaker. 
<laughs> let me use my relative newness in, in, in the job as an ex excuse here, but I don't believe that the capacity exists to amend amendments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alec Edward. Mr. Edward. Uh, sir, can I congratulate the Minister on a strong, decisive and good government today, unlike so much that passes for government around this place. Could I ask him to confirm if he would agree that given that FM and DFM produce these amendments, that they have never shared their legal advice around these amendments, that they never brought these amendments to the executive, that they never brought them to the Environment Committee, that they never asked any citizen or any group in this part of the world what their view on those amendments were. Does he agree with me that far from you failing in your duties as a minister, people should look elsewhere about failure as ministers, in particular the office of First and Deputy First Minister, in particular the role, the role of the First Minister? And could I further ask the, uh, the minister, Given that the gaping hole in all of this is the failure of FM and DFM to share their legal advice, despite the torrent of legal advice against their view, does that not reveal how weak, shallow and short-sighted all of this has been? Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr Atwood. It is not often that I disagree with M Mr Atwood, so I won't start now. <laughs> Order, mem members, that concludes questions to the Minister of State, Thank Lord Morrow. Yep. Um, Mr Chairman, we had a very serious situation arose during this debate today, and I would like you uh, to investigate the behaviour of the Chair of the Environment Committee. This was an absolute abuse of her position as Chair of the Committee when in fact she did on a number of occasions, having been asked, was she speaking as chair of the committee, she made it clear, yes, I am speaking on, as chair of the committee. Given the inference, of course, that she was speaking on behalf of the committee and articulating the views of the committee. Chair, this obviously can't go on. And this was a blatant attempt to walk round the rules and the standing orders of this House. And this has got to stop and the member has to be investigated as to her behaviour here today. Can you give the House an assurance that her behaviour will be uh, investigated as a result of what she has done here today? Lord Morrow, in listening to Lord Morrow's point of order, there are a number of issues in the round that he has raised. Uh, first of all, chairs of committee come here. Uh, they indicate clearly to the table that they want to be called as chair of a committee. And I have always indicated to, to chairs of committees, it should be a question on behalf of the committee. It should not be statements. should not be statements. That is the first point. Secondly, I would say to Lord Morrow, this is really an issue for the committee to deal with and not for this House. And I think it's important I say that uh, to Lord Morrow. Point of order. Point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, I just wonder if you could also check Hansard uh, to see whether the Minister was misleading the House when, uh, in an answer he gave a few moments ago, he indicated that neither OFM, DFM nor the proposers of the amendments were knocking down his door to get these moved forward, when it is a matter of public record that uh, I put down a written question which I got an answer from the Department in September as to when he was bringing forward the further consideration stage as one of the movers uh, of the amendments, and I would ask him uh, if you could look at that, but also that the, the member of the minister withdraw then uh, the accusation certainly against the, the movers of the amendment. Listening to the member's point of order, the member needs to be careful in accusing the minister of misleading the House. But, but, yes, well, 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 even the terminology, but I'm happy enough to look at Hansard and come back to the member. Happy enough to do that or come back to the House. <laughs>